Okay. okay, so welcome everyone this afternoon to our office hours. Let's see, today we are going to be talking about the advanced written notice and written notice. So we focus on the written notice, but we throw in the advanced written notice just for some fun. All right, let's start off with introductions of our team. My name is Carly Thibodeau. Um, I joined the department, the main department of education and this team just about a year and a half ago. And before that, I was a teacher for 21 years. And Colette Sullivan, our, our federal programs coordinator is here with us today. Hi everyone, nice to see so many of you. Uh, for those of you who've joined us a million times before, I apologize that you hear the same introductions every single time, but yes, I was a special ed teacher as well for 30 years before I joined the department about five years ago. Awesome, thank you. And I think Jennifer is gonna pop on and say hi real quick. Absolutely. Um, I'm Jennifer Gleason. Like everyone else on the team, I was a special education teacher before I joined the department about two and a half years ago. Great, thank you. And Ashley is with us. Hi everybody, I'm Ashley Satry, and I am. I joined the team about six months ago. And before that, I was a special ed teacher for 14 years in Maine and Virginia. Awesome, thank you. And Julie. Hi, I'm Julie Pelletier. I'm the admin support for the monitoring team. I am starting my seventh year with the DOE, and prior to joining um, Department of Education, I was admin support at a K-5 to elementary school for 16 years. Excellent. Thank you. All right. And this is our contact information. If you want to get in touch with any one of us, this is the best way to do it. We do our best to get back to you within a day or two. Um, as we get going, this is our agenda. We just did quick introductions. Um, we'll go over that advanced written notice, the written notice. We will talk about the importance of the written notice in case law. Uh, there are some commonly asked questions also included here. And at any time we can answer questions. So please feel free to um, come off of mute and ask questions. We are kind of a bigger group. So if you're not comfortable doing that, please drop questions in the chat box. We will monitor that as we go. Um, and we also have some resources at the end. So we're going to jump right in. This link will take you to the procedural manual, which is one of the resources that I share at the end, but I'll talk about it now. It's a great resource. This is the table of contents, it has all of those special ed forms that you deal with on a daily basis. And um, this one in particular will take you to the advanced written notices on page three. Um, that advanced written notice is used to provide notice of notice to parties of an upcoming IEP team meeting. So this is taken right out of the procedural manual because the procedural manual does a great job giving instructions, directions, and examples. So that's why we give a lot of um, praise to it throughout our trainings. Uh, the So here is where you document all of that information, the parent, the child information, the SAU information. You're also going to want to record the date of the IEP team meeting, the time, and the location. This is also the part of the advanced written notice where you would check off the purpose of the meeting. And just a little side note that if you are working with students where you will be talking about transition planning, um, you want to make sure you're checking off that post-secondary goals and transition services box that is necessary for those students when you're talking about transition planning. Another part of the advanced written notice is where you fill in the participants who are invited to the IEP team meeting. So you should make sure that you fill out their name and their role. You can see here that some of the roles are there um, next to where you would put the person's name, such as a special ed teacher. Uh, but if it isn't specified, make sure to include that after their name. There's also a spot on the advanced written notice where you can document that um, your attempts at getting the parents to attend the meetings um, because you wanna make all of your efforts to reach out to the parents and hold the meeting at a mutually agreed upon time and place. 
Um, and so here it says documentation of at least two attempts. I know that when I was teaching and I was setting up meetings, I actually like to have three attempts documented in my advance written notices just to be on the safe side. Uh, and then also on the advanced written notice, this is where you would have the parents sign if you were not able to give seven days advance notice of the IEP team meeting. For So for some reason, um, you had to hold the meeting very quickly within those seven days, you would just have them sign this waiver saying that it was okay that they didn't get that seven days notice. Uh, okay, so there's a question in the chat that asks, are there any plans to update the advanced written notice and written notice form so the check, box sh check boxes match? And I do not believe that there are any plans to update those forms at this time. And so, and Lena, do you have a question that you want to come off of mute and ask? I do. I'm just too lazy to type. I type all day. Um, so sadly, we have um, meetings within the seven days more often than not. Uh, not more often, not more often than we'd like. Mm -hmm. um, and we send. So we have, you know, verbal permission from the parent who agreed to attend the meeting. We send the Google Calendar invite because obviously all of our meetings are via Zoom. And then um, we send that advanced written notice via DocuSign. If the parent signs that after the fact, so what I, I mean, like, it just seems awkward, right? Because they're slow at doing DocuSign. So they've come to the meeting and I have to say, oh, by the way, I sent the advance written notice to you via DocuSign. You haven't sent it. You haven't signed it yet. Um, how does that look on, you know, from a compliance standpoint? And um, I have a follow-up question. Because they were in attendance of the meeting. And I know, like during COVID, I, this was an issue we would have, and we didn't have DocuSign, so we would just have to get the parent to sign it when they came into the school after the meeting. Um, okay. So compliance-wise, as long as you have that waiver signed, I think that... Okay, that fine. Because what I've been doing is putting like my own text within the date saying like when we agreed to meet, like, you know, like, um, and then having them put the date they signed it. So, okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. And it is, yes, seven calendar days. Okay. The other part of the advance written notice is just a spot where you can put enclosures if you're sending anything home along with the advance written notice. This might be procedural safeguards um, or anything else, any other forms or paperwork. Okay, so just some things to keep in mind with the advanced written notice. There should be alignment between the advanced written notice and written notice itself. Um, it sounds like maybe those check boxes on the front don't line up as well as they should. Uh, but if you are noting something on the advanced written notice, it should typically be noted on the written notice. However, if you discuss other information at the meeting, obviously note that on the written notice. Um, they don't have to match exactly but there should be alignment. Okay, so I know we just answered some questions from the chat box. So Carly, would we simply say in the written notice, although the intent of this meeting was to do the annual review, the team decided to talk about the triannual. Do we have to specify that it wasn't on the advanced written notice? No. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, oh geez, sorry about that. I just got a little ahead of myself. So there we are, we're checking in. Now let's talk about, we're diving into the written notice. Okay. Sorry, another question just popped up. We have a lot of meetings that are rescheduled. Do we have to send another advanced written notice for the new meeting date? Yes. Yes, you need to have an advanced written notice for the actual date of the meeting. Should we keep the advance written notice that are rescheduled uh, documented? Like, should we print and file them and write on there that the parent canceled or just don't, just dis discard them? I believe, I think that that is your decision and however you all, like uh, 
your SAU would track that paperwork. Um, but we would, compliance wise, we would just need to see an advance written notice that matches up with the written notice of that meeting in that IEP. Would love to have folks add in chat what they do, just out of curiosity. All right. So the written notice um, is a federal um, requirement. It comes from IDEA. And you can see here, this is where it comes from. It's also in MUSER, the main unified special ed regulations. And the italicized words are the parts that are specific to MUSER that go above and beyond the IDA requirements. Um, and it's listed uh, in the procedural safeguards. These are the things that must be included within the written notice. And so that's how the form of the written notice is set up with those six basically things that you need to answer or questions that you need to answer. Um, and then all of this other information. And we'll go over each of these parts individually. So as I said before, the written notice is based on federal law from IDEA. In the written notice, you refers to the parents. And this document really allows the parents to review, dis review decisions before implementation of the IEP because they, you're discussing all this information at the IEP meeting, the parent is there, or maybe they're not there. And then they have that those seven days to think about it, potentially change their mind. Um, so you, you need to give them that time. And this document allows them to review those decisions and determinations. Now, the last one here, this last bullet point is bolded because this is really important to think about the written notice. Courts and hearing officers view the written notice as a critical document that provides a written record of how and why decisions are made. If you have ever listened to us in our other trainings, I think we say this the most in our abbreviated day training, but we say if it's not in the written notice, it didn't happen. And if you are, you're like, how do I let the people know that we just talked about this in the IEP meeting? You document it in the written notice. So if you have things that you're proposing or you're refusing, um, this is where you put that because this is where those decisions are going to be made, be made from, from the written notice. If the IEP is questionable, the courts and hearing officers would go back to the written notice for that document, looking for that discussion. And the federal regulations required that the written notice be provided to the parents within a reasonable time. And then MUSER went above and beyond those requirements and defined that time as that seven days prior to the implementation of the IEP. And so in the written notice, um, this is to notify parents with proposed actions or refusing to take actions on any of these things listed here, such as referral, evaluation, identification, et cetera. And then this is where that timeline is noted on the written notice. You can see it says dear and it addresses the parents. Usually if you have a vendor that's pre-filled, um, but if you don't, make sure you're addressing that to the parents and or the student, depending on if they are included in that. And then the, at least seven days prior to the date upon which they'll be receiving services, you need to give them this, they need to be given this notice. So what that looks like is you may have an annual meeting date because when you have your annual meeting date, you wouldn't start your IEP right then. You need to give them that seven days notice. So your I, your annual meeting date, like let's say one six twenty three. And then you want to give some days to get that written notice finished, get it sent out in the mail. So then the parents would have it, let's say, three days later. And then the duration of the IEP could start seven days from when you think that the parents would have that. So typically, the duration of the IEP would start about 10 days out from the annual IEP on the um, 
for the annual. Um, so that's the guidance around the timeline. Now I see a question came in because yes, they can waive their right to that seven day notice and that IEP can be implemented sooner than that seven days. You can use that optional seven day waiver form that can be found in the procedural manual. And I'm sure it's on our website as a form. Um, however, you have to document that in the written notice if they waive their right to seven day notice. So, and it's the parents that can waive their right, not the IEP team or anyone else. Only the parents can waive their right to that seven day notice. And then the IEP can be implemented sooner. Okay, so here's a little, little quiz. When can a parent or guardian not waive their seven day notice? Does anyone know? Okay, so we have an, an initial IEP. Any other time they could not waive if they're not at the meeting, right? And we have changed guidance around this based off of information that was given to us. Um, it was brought to our attention that there's only one instance when they cannot waive their seven day notice. We used to say it was the initial placement and if they did not attend the meeting. However, they can waive their seven day notice for that initial placement. The only time that they cannot waive their seven day notice is if they are not at the, at the meeting to waive that notice. So that is new information as of the last time we've talked about the written notice is that you can waive or the parents can waive their seven day notice at an initial. So something else to think about is what if you hold that IEP meeting, but the parent or guardian is not in attendance? Can you give them a call later and talk to them about the meeting, give them details, get their input? It really would be a change in the IEP and you would need to complete a new written notice if you did that. If you contacted them after the meeting, you're getting input from them after the fact and you would want to document their input and it would most likely change the outcome of the meeting. So that's why you really would need to do an amendment of the IEP and complete a new written notice if you were to call them and have a conversation after the meeting. Okay, any other questions come up? I have a question kind of in regards to that. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we call a parent, they're not able to attend, they give us permission to hold the meeting without them. If mm -hmm. they're in agreement with everything that was decided and they don't want anything different, would we still need to do an amendment? No, you contacted them prior to the IEP meeting? Yes. Yeah, so for an example, a parent couldn't come, they had an appointment, mm -hmm. they were okay with everybody meeting. Yep. We had the meeting, made determinations, called the parent after to just let them know what was talked okay. about, what was decided, and they mm -hmm. were in agreement with that. Would we still need to do an amendment? Um, I No, you would not have to amend the IEP if there were no changes made to the IEP. However, if they gave input or you know gave some information, you may need to do an additional written notice to capture that conversation with the parent and what their input was. I It all depends on the situation. I'm not sure what your conversation entailed and what they, you know, what they gave you. But if you talked to them prior to the meeting and got in, input from them and it was captured in that original written notice, even though they didn't attend the meeting, but you had talked to them prior, then that conversation would be documented there. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Does the seven day prior notice count with amendments? So that would be an amendment without a meeting. And so the seven day prior notice, you still do need to give them seven days prior notice. So when you do that written notice without a meeting, 
the changes on the IEP? That's a good question. I don't know if I know the answer to that. Would the new things on the IEP, would the amendment date start the they, day? They need seven days written notice of any changes. Okay, so if the written notice went, if people were informed like on the 10th, then whatever the changes on the IEP were couldn't happen until the 20th because that would give time to get the notice home. Yeah, you would still you would still need the seven day notice with or without and and you would still need to ask them to waive if you wanted to or you, they'd have to give you permission to waive if it wanted to start sooner. Right. So if you have an amendment date on the IEP, it would right. out those seven days. Correct. Yep. Oh, mm -hmm. Okay. There is another question. Am I correct that we need to check the initial referral el eligibility box anytime we are determining eligibility, even to include triennial reevaluations? Is I'd have to look at the form. Is there a reevaluation checkbox or is it only eligibility? I thought there I was think a there's, a yeah, there's, there's a reevaluation checkbox. Yeah. yeah, I think there is there is a reevaluation. Re yeah, there is. So I would say that you would check the reevaluation box if it's a reevaluation. Yep. Okay. And okay, so embedded within this PowerPoint are some templates and exemplars for each of the sections of the written notice because we know from feedback from the field that it is really helpful to have those. However, this is, these are just guidance and it is going to be different in every situation. This is not, we're not saying this is how you have to fill out the written notice or these are the pieces that you need to include, but these are just some examples to help you see what it might look like. So again, a link to the procedural manual where it talks about the written notice on page 87. And the written notice really describes those team decisions, including any that were proposed and or rejected and any data that supports those decisions, because this is really the district's offer of FAPE, Free Appropriate Public Education for the Child. Um, and just a little note that a written notice must be generated after every IEP meeting, or if there's an agreement with the parents to amend the IEP without a meeting or any other time that the SAU makes decisions that affect that fate for the student. So here we have the written notice, this first section of the written notice. You have that parent information, the child's information, the SAU information, a spot to put the date of the team meeting or the date of the agreement for amendment without the team meeting. So it's really important to fill in those dates on the written notice um, and also the date sent to the parent. The written notice also has that checkbox like the advanced written notice for the purpose of the meeting. Um, again, this should align with that advanced written notice, but it's obviously not going to mirror that. Um, and you can check more than one box, just like you can on the advanced written notice. So if you are talking about an initial referral and it ends up being the annual because the student qualifies, you can check off both. There's that evaluation, reevaluation. And again, if you have a student that's in high school and you're talking about transition services, you would want to check that off that you are talking about those. And then the procedural manual goes over directions around filling out the written notice. So it's, again, great resource. Section one is all about describing the actions regarding the referral, evaluation, identification, programming, or placement proposed or refused by the SAU. So this is really those determinations made at the IEP team meeting. Here are some further directions on section one, and we'll go over some, um, some points. So this is where you're listing those proposals or refusals. 
and you're going to list them in a way that is friendly for anyone that views this document, especially the parent. Um, try to make it as easy to read as possible. Uh, and then this is not the place to put the why you're doing these things or making these determinations. The why goes in section two. So when you're thinking about section one, these are some things that may be included in this section, like you may be going over the referral of a child for special ed, you may be discussing eligibility dis decisions about whether they qualify for special education services, um, agreements reached without reached with parents without a meeting, things like that. So when you're in section one, when you're filling in information in section one, be very specific so that parents can go there and easily see those determinations that are made. Um, I know that when I was writing written notices and when I check over written notices, it's easier for me if it's either numbered or bulleted um, or set up in some way so that you can easily go to each point and determination that was made during the meeting. Um, and just remembering that the determinations at the IEP meeting are made by consensus, but if the consensus is not reached, the SAU will make the final decision. And also the purpose is not necessary to put in section one because you've checked off the purpose with the check boxes. So you don't need to list that here. And if the parent agrees to waive their seven day notice that you state that in section one. So here's that template. Again, just a little guide of how you might want to think about filling out section one. So the red just talks about statements of all determinations made by the IEP team during the IEP meeting. And I like to think of this as your outline or table of contents for the IEP being developed. So really thinking about, okay, if I'm thinking about section one of the IEP, what did we decide was going to go here? Section two, section three, and so on for the IEP. So just making sure that I think about each piece of the IEP and have those decisions outlined here. And then a little example, we've got Mr. Exemplar and Ms. True, and you can see here that they have given permission to waive their right to seven day notice. So that was documented here and they explicitly noted when that IEP would begin, what date that would begin. Um, they also talked about receiving procedural safeguards and uh, a reevaluation that was coming up and other things. So moving on to section two, um, this is where you put the why. You are explaining why the SAU is proposing or refusing to take the above actions. So whatever you put in section one, now you're explaining why you're doing those things that you put in section one. So, and that's another reason I like to number it or bullet it because I like to make sure that one number in number one matches the other number in number two, but that's just me. Um, so here in section two, you want to explain why the SAU is proposing or refusing to do those things from section one, talking about if serv services are changing, why they're changing, what's the data to support that. Um, if they're not changing, why aren't they changing? Also include data to support that. And then again, just remembering that this entire document really should be written in a way that parents can understand but especially these two sections where you're making those determinations and talking about why those determinations were made. So here's just a little template of how you may set up section two. Remember, number those sections. So again, this is outlined like the IEP. So number one should match number one from uh, section one and two to two and so on. At least that's how I would like to set it up. If you have bullets that just match each other, that would be fine too. But this is all about the why. And then here's that example. We have Ms. True and Mr. Exemplar up here. And so it explains that they why they've waived their right. And then it just gives a little reminder that if the parent was not in attendance, then they would not be able to give permission to waive their right. 
Um, and then also around the procedural safeguards, they're offered at each annual meeting. So that's the why that connects to that statement in section one. And then all of these things following match back to section one explaining why. And you can see just glancing through, you can see some data points, um, some standard scores and some other things listed there. All right. Any questions or comments about section one or two of the written notice so far? I think there have been some things in chat. Let me just scroll back here. Seven. Right, the seven day waiver form is optional. You must document it in the written notice. And yes, and you can place that comment multiple times within the written notice that they've waived their seven day notice. So there's a question about my team tends to list all accommodations the team determined. Is this required or is it sufficient to write the team reviewed accommodations and updated them accordingly? How specific do we need to be with the details? That is your decision. Again, as long as it's clear to the people in the, including the parents that are going to be reading the written notice, um, I think that updating them accordingly, reviewing and updating is appropriate. I know that when I was writing written notices, I would, if I was changing them, I would say the ones I took off and the ones I added and just say that I kept the other ones the same, that sort of thing. Um, I think be as specific as you can without making a, a ton of work for yourself. We say document everything, but we know there's a lot of things that happen that don't always get documented. And I mean, it just happens. Do the best you can with it. Okay. Can the team note in section two that the parent waived their right to seven days prior notice of the determinations as the explanation of the section one with the effective date? Section one. I think that that would be fine. Yes, I, section two, you can say that they waived their seven days prior notice, where in section one, you noted that the IEP was starting on that effective date. Yes. Okay. You guys ask great questions, by the way. So keep them coming. Moving on to section three of the written notice, this is where you describe each evaluation procedure assessment record or report the SAU, SAU used as a basis for the proposed or refused actions. So when you're here, you're recording all that information by the team that they're sharing. So really this, I know when I was writing written notices, I know I say that a lot, but I just go back to what I know, I would write, the team member that was speaking and the information that they gave, including any data that they reported out for that student in this section. This was kind of where most of my notes were from the meeting. Um, this can also be where you're documenting the introduction of those team members and discussing that confidentiality statement made at the meeting. That's a good idea to do that. Uh, this is where any evaluation information would go if you're reviewing evaluations as part, part of that initial or reeval. So this is where the bulk of your data and information will get listed. So this really reflects the discussion that's happening at the IEP team meeting, where the number one is more of those determinations, what you all decided and why you decided those in number two, and then this is that discussion in the supporting data. Again, this template just kind of sets it up so that you keep each piece of the IEP in mind. That's why it says like one, two, and three not addressed in this section because you're not really talking about that. Um, so here's the example 
And this just goes through, you can see here that there are some names of some of the team members like Mrs. Good, Mr. Speak, and it just gives their um, summary of what they shared at the IEP meeting with the team, including any data that they may have given around the student's progress. Then section four is where you describe any other options that the, te that the team, which includes the parent considered and the reasons why those options were rejected. Um, so these are often things around the least restrictive environment statement um, or those options that you were thinking about, whether they're going to be receiving those services in the general ed setting versus the special ed setting. This might be where you talk about we talked about keeping the programming the same. However, we decided to increase services for specially designed instruction in reading because they weren't making the progress that we had hoped or things like that. So this is where those options go and the things that you considered but may not have happened. Section five is where you describe any other factors that are relevant to the SAU's proposed or refused actions described above. Um, this is, I sometimes uh, medical information gets put here or behavior information or any other attendance, family stuff might get listed here. This is just anything else that may go into decisions made by the IEP team. Carly, can I pause you for a second? Sure thing. It's just a really good question in chat about evaluations in section three and whether they should be summarized or detailed um, just before we get too far away from section three. Okay. Is this the, I was at another training with representatives from Drummond and Woodson. Yep. No need to list evaluation results in section three for eligibility as the information is found in the evaluation reports and eligibility adverse effect forms. Additionally, in other states, Worked. We always provided a summary of evaluations. Not all of the evaluation data support. What is guidance regarding this? Our teachers are adding all scores. Written makes for a long written notice. Excuse me. Just a copy of the evaluation report. Could we summarize the info of the scores that matter for eligibility instead of all the scores? Um, yeah, I mean, if you were at a training with Drummond and Woodson and they said that there was no need to list all of the evaluation results, I mean, I would go with what they were saying. I think that whatever the IEP team discusses and makes decisions about and the data that backs that up. Um, so I would like, like, if I was writing information in Section 3 and I was reporting out on an evaluation, I would probably take the eval name, the date that the eval was done, and I would put the subtest scores. I wouldn't get into the specifics necessarily, but I would definitely give the overall information or like the, yeah. And just Carly, this is Colette. You'd, you'd want to make sure that you're just in incorporating the scores that support the student's strengths and weaknesses, really. What supports the disability category? That's the biggie. Okay, great. Thanks for jumping in. Okay. Carly, since Colette had jumped in, uh, Colette, you were the one that at a previous training had mentioned that the um, back to section one, actually, the waiver from the parent needed to be noted in there. So I just want to, and I know that's different than what I just heard at this meeting. So I just want clarification on that that the waiver the seven day waiver needed to be included in the written notice in section one yes well i know for us lena um good question we always say about the written notice like this information is regulatory it's important of course but if we can find the information we need somewhere in the document then we don't really care if it's in section one or section four you know what i mean like we're pretty good at finding what we need so i wouldn't i wouldn't um we're pretty good at finding what we need. I love the answer. Thank you. <laughs> okay, section six is around describing 
the points made by the parents, including the parents' description of their child's progress. So when you are writing this in the written notice, you're really pointing out anything that the parents talked about, what they gave input on during the IEP team meeting. This is not exactly the same as what is being asked on the IEP when it asks in considerations around the concerns of the parents. So just sometimes we see copy and paste from the written notice to those concerns. The concerns on the IEP are really the concerns. They can align to each other because as you can see in this example, their concerns are in the written notice. However, they pulled those out and put them in the IEP, but didn't put in all that other information about how the parents are excited about her progress in reading and math, and that they're hoping she'll receive accommodations for standardized testing. <clears throat> so again, here's just a template, remembering that section four is really that statement of the team decision for the least restrictive environment for the student. Those are those options that the team considered and why those were rejected. And then any other factors, again, some ideas of what could be put there and then descriptions by the parent. And you can see our example in section four, they have what they talked about. Joe was making progress with his current level. And so they decided to keep their S specially designed instruction time the same. And then in section five, they just wrote none at this time because there were no other factors. So just making sure that that isn't blank, you do wanna fill that in. And then you can see description of the points made by the parents. On the written notice, there's also a spot to fill in who, where, the phone number that the parent can contact at the school district if they have questions or concerns. This is usually the special ed director. Um, and this is typically pre-filled if you have a vendor. Also, just, I know I just kind of said this about relating to section five, but it goes to anything. There really should not be any blank sections on the written notice. If there is something, if there's nothing to put there, you can just put none at this time, NA, you know, put something in there, it cannot be blank. And then for the members attended, for the team members, um, when you have an in-person meeting, you're going to record the people that attended the meeting and the date of that meeting. If you are doing an amendment and there was no meeting, you want to record the names of the people that were informed of the decisions and the date that they were informed. And then this section on the written notice is for students that are being placed in special ed or receiving special education services for the first time. There does need to be a signature here from the parents before they can begin receiving special education services. And then again, the written notice has a spot for enclosures. Those would be, you can list things here that are being sent home with that written notice, procedural safeguards, those eligibility forms, parental consent to evaluate, things like that. Okay, any other questions? If a parent does not attend the meeting, we put them on the written notice. If, if you are having an in-person meeting and the parent is not at the meeting, you would not put them on the written notice. The written notice is for the people that were at the meeting, those people listed. Okay. And remember, if it's not in the written notice, it didn't happen. So just remember, try to document as much as you can. Carly, there's and this, one more question in there about um, a transfer student not being able to find the consent for services. Should they obtain a new consent form? I, I don't know. I don't. I mean, if they are, if they have an IEP and they've been receiving services from another school. I don't think that it's necessary, but I will have to get back to you with a better answer because 
I'm not 100% sure. Colette or Jennifer, do you? I would agree with you, Carly. I mean, you can't go back and get that done. You can always document it in the written notice. And I wouldn't see a problem with signing another consent and then just documenting why. Document, document, document. You're never going to document too much. Well, that's exactly what we do. We just say in the written notice that we could not find the initial provisions signature and that we asked them to sign that. And in the enclosures, I'll write written notice of this meeting for signature of initial provision because it couldn't be found. Just to cover us, I guess. <laughs> Okay. Excellent. All right. So um, that document, everything, this kind of lends itself to this pretty familiar case, Andrew F. versus the Douglas County School District. Um, if you're not real familiar with it, there are some good in informational websites out there. But this is about a student that was attending a public school. He was not making progress from year to year. He had the same goals from year to year. The parents pulled him out from the public school, put him in a private school, and he started making progress. So the parents took the public school to court. And at first, the court ruled with the school saying that, yep, that's okay, merely more than de minimis. Well, then it went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the parents and said, no, this is not okay. Every student deserves to have appropriately ambitious goals, and the public school did not meet its obligation under IDEA to offer an IEP that's reasonably calculated to enable a child to make progress appropriate in light of the child's circumstances. So you really want to be documenting in your written notice around the progress of the child and making sure that you are talking about those services that they're receiving, any supplementary aids, modifications, accommodations that are appropriate and necessary for that student to be successful, um, making sure that the school personnel have supports that they need to support that student in being successful, and just really t focusing and talking about and having that discussion around those measurable IEP goals and whether or not the child is making progress on those goals because this is where we start talking about written notice importance in case law. So it was noted that there were some common mistakes around the written notice documenting, it. the written notice failed to document the team discussion about the child's current lack of progress. And so there either wasn't data available or there was no discussion in the written notice or documented in the written notice around that data documenting that lack of progress. So if there is lack of progress or no progress or you know anything for that student, you really need to document that in the written notice. Data should be included in those that why you're making those determinations um, and that should be documented in detail. Uh, another thing, another mistake that was noted in an important case law was that the written notice indicated a change of least restrictive environment for a student, um, but it did not indicate the parent's disagreement or agreement to the changes. So if that least restrictive environment change happens without that seven day notice, that would be another thing that would that is not a good thing, that's a mistake. The district needs to indicate in the written notice that the disagreement or agreement discussion and why the IEP team made the least restrictive environment change. So making sure that if you're changing that, that the you're noting that the parents are in agreement or disagreement with that change and giving them that notice. Okay, and just don't forget, it's not in the written notice, it didn't happen. So make sure if things are happening, it's there. Um, I'm not gonna go through each of these, there are just a few, but these were some commonly asked questions uh, around the written notice. So I'm just gonna kind of skip through these. You can, you have access to the PowerPoint, so you can look at those. And any other questions? There have been a lot of questions today. I love the discussion. It's been great. 
Thank you, team, for jumping in. Our IEP changes seven calendar days or school days to allow nights. It's uh, seven calendar days. Calendar days and school days are definitely tricky. It's not always noted. Okay. Just a few resources to share. We have that procedural manual. The title procedural manual is a link that will take you directly to the procedural manual. So it's a great resource. A lot of the information from today's PowerPoint came from the procedural manual. Our main unified special ed regulations or MUSER, another great resource, not as user-friendly as the procedural manual, but has all of those rules and regulations. The IEP quick reference document, this goes through each section of the IEP and talks about criteria to make that compliant. It's on our website and uh, written notice fun facts. We have a spot on our website that uh, about different fun facts and the written notice fun fact can be found there. Just a quick one pager about everything for the written notice. And then our other resources, we have our PD calendar where you can sign up for upcoming PD and then our link to recordings and PowerPoints um, that we've already done and you can watch those on at any time and you can get a contact hour for those and then other links to resources, special ed resources. And then this is that schedule. We've actually, we're at the very bottom of this now, 11024 at the bottom. So all of these ones above can be found on that recording website if you missed it and would like a chance to watch those or listen to those. And then these are our upcoming professional developments. Uh, some are office hours, some are during the day, like our all district IEP training in the spring, but we go until the end of May. And then we ask for you to share with your general ed teachers. If they would like to join our PD, that would be great. We did one on October and that link will take you to that recording. Um, and then we have one coming up in April around special ed law for gen ed teachers. And then we have some that we feel would be more appropriate or more focused for related service providers, writing measurable functional goals and avoiding outcomes and consultation related service goals. And our feedback and contact hour form. So this is, we ask for feedback after every PD we use the feedback, we try to do our best to incorporate um, the feedback that we get and make our PD better. And, hold on, uh, sorry, trying to multitask. There we go. And um, then you can get a contact hour certificate for attending today's training. Today is 11024 written notice office hour. So that's the training that you'll be looking for. Enter your email and you will get a contact hour. And our contact information one more time because we are here to support you. So please reach out if you have questions, if you have, if you're writing IEPs and you are like, oh, I don't know if this is a great goal or if you're anything, you can send us hypotheticals. Just don't send us anything in the IEP document. Um, and we are happy to give you feedback about those things. All right. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. And I am going to stop sharing. And there we go. All right. So have a great one. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, everyone.